Our game hacking binary approach so far has been focused on making small changes to the way that the game works. These small changes work when the size of our changes matches the space we have available to make the change. So for example, if we change a jump equal opcode to a jump zero opcode, that approach works fine because the size of the changed instruction is the same size as the existing instruction. But what happens if we want to do something which takes up more space than we actually have available to us? If we just add more instructions, we will overwrite existing instructions, which is likely going to cause the game process to crash at some point. If we need more space, we need to make or find that space elsewhere within application memory and then redirect application flow to that space. Detours, function hooking and code caves are different words and steps for this similar type of approach, which we are going to explain and demonstrate as part of this video. To create a working code cave, we need to identify and have a few things. Firstly, we need to know where we want to influence execution by creating a hook. For example, in a first-person shooter game, we might want to know where and how the player outline is being drawn, and we might want to introduce additional code to change the outline color before the draw takes place if we are creating an ESP hack. So in that case, we would want to set up our hook somewhere near the player draw functionality. Once we know the place that we want to set up the hook, we need somewhere to redirect the execution flow to. The redirection should change the flow of execution to a larger space in memory where we can write our modification instructions to influence how the game works without having that limitation of space. Basically, if we direct execution to a larger space, also known as a code cave, we have much more space and freedom to influence the game's behavior. Once we have the hook and redirection in place, we then need to carefully preserve the current state, do our hacking business, put the state back to how it was when we first found it, and finally, trampoline the application flow back to the old location without breaking anything. Seems simple enough, right? But what does that look like in practice? Let's walk over a manual example with some simple example code. Let's say we have the following application, which updates a counter with some random number and then sleeps for that amount of time. The application prints out some text which states that the counter has been updated, but there is no easy way to see exactly what the counter value actually is during program execution. So how can we identify the current value of the counter at each iteration? Like most things, there are probably a number of ways to do this. But let's solve the problem by hooking the function, redirecting to a code cave, writing some ASM, and then jumping back to the next instruction after the introduced hook. To start, let's launch the application, load up a debugger, and attach to the running process. Let's first find the location which we want to hook. Since we know the program already prints out some information as static text, let's choose to hook before that printf call is actually performed. So looking at the ASM, let's choose E51074 as our hook location. At this location, we can see that the current random counter is moved into the ESI register from the EDX register. So at this point, the value stored in the EDX register is the value we actually care about. So now we know where we want to hook. Now we need to find where we want to redirect execution flow to. Let's find somewhere in the application which currently isn't being used. If we scroll down in the debugger, we can see a bunch of uninitialized space down here. So let's choose this location, E51D10, and hope we don't break anything by writing here. So now we know where we want to set up our hook and also where we want to redirect execution flow to. To actually redirect the flow, we can change the existing instructions to jump directly to our code cave address. The size of this jump is going to be five bytes. We need one byte for the jump instruction opcode and four bytes for the actual address we want to jump to. 
Pressing the spacebar, we can enter the jump instruction and the address location directly to set up our hook. But now we already have a problem. Due to the size of the hook, our change has just partially overwritten some adjacent instructions and we have caused a mess by jumbling up those existing instructions. If we look back at the original instructions before we overwrote them, we can see that our jump patch will mangle two remaining dangling bytes because the bytes FF, FF will still remain in place after adding our five byte jump overwrite. So let's clean this part of the mess up by entering no operation or not bytes here over the now misaligned two bytes. This way, we can prevent this misalignment from causing problems when we later return to this address and the program continues executing these instructions. Let's test this out by setting a breakpoint here so we can see what happens when this part of the code is hit. If we continue execution, we can follow the jump and see that we are redirected down to our code cave. Looking good so far, but what do we want to do now that we are actually here? Let's change the way the application works by modifying the current print functionality. Let's first move the random value into ESI from EDX, which is one of the operations we overwrote for our jump and need to redo anyway. We can then push the value now stored in ESI onto the stack to prepare for our new print call. Next, we need to push a format string to call printf with the number now on the stack. Because we are no longer going to print a string, we are going to print a number instead. Let's search for an existing format string by going into the current memory map and just searching for the pattern percentage %d, which is 2564 in hex, followed by a 0a00 to terminate the format string specifier in a Windows acceptable format. We can take any of the results we just found, copy the address of the format string specifier and push that address to the stack too. Now that the stack is set up, we can actually call printf, then add four more bytes to ESP to clean up since we just added another item onto the stack, which the program wasn't really expecting. And finally, we can jump back up to the NOPS at E51079 where we first set up our hijack. Now, instead of the application printing the updated the counter string, the application will instead print the value of the counter every time this loop is iterated over. We have now modified the application by not just changing existing space aligned opcodes like we did during the binary patching video, but by instead creating additional space which we can use to basically do anything we want without the prior size restrictions. If we continue application execution and remove our breakpoints, we can see function hooking in action. The random value is now printing out prior to each sleep call. This is a small example, but for a real game hack, we don't really want to be manually attaching a debugger and hot patching ASM mid game. So let's instead update our game trainer to include functionality to programmatically perform function hooking. First, we need to update our memory code to include a function to handle code caves. This code cave function takes a destination address, which is where we will jump to, a patched function address, which is where we will write our hook, and the number of bytes which have been mangled as part of our write. We know the size of the jump, which is five bytes, so we can also calculate the total size of this patch, which is going to be the size of the jump, as well as the total number of mangled bytes. Our jump offset can be calculated by subtracting the patched function location from the destination address and the actual jump length. Next, we allocate a byte buffer, which is the size of the patch we need to write, Knop out the entire buffer using memset, write a jump opcode to the first byte, use memcopy to write the jump offset location address, and finally use our existing writebytes function to actually write our patch into the game's code. 
So there we have our code K function, which basically performs the same manual process we just walked through. But what is the actual destination address? Before, we found the destination address by randomly looking for space in the binary. But since our trainer is already injecting into the game as a DLL, we can actually just create our own space rather than searching for and using unpredictable, currently unused space. We can create our own space by simply defining a function and passing that function's address as a parameter to this code cave function. And how do we recreate those bytes which we overwrote when creating the hook? To solve this problem, we can just use inline ASM and write ASM code directly within our trainer functions. When writing these inline ASM functions, we don't want the compiler to help us out by creating stack frames like it usually does, because that will likely mess up how the game is currently executing and storing data, which we don't want. To prevent the compiler from doing this, we can use the decal spec and naked keywords to prevent the compiler from doing anything when the function is entered and exited. You will be successful at crashing the game enough on your own without the compiler helping you out. With all the busy work set up, we can now create an example hook function to fix a resolution bug in the game. In the Age of Empires game, due to the age of the game and the size of screen resolutions back then, the player scores and names can get messed up if they become too long. This can be annoying, but with some reverse engineering and code caves, we can solve this problem. To save some time in an already long video, I'll skip the reverse engineering step here. But basically, the game is writing the player scores and names in a rectangular clip region. If the data to be written is wider than the size of the rectangle, the data disappears behind the rectangle and isn't drawn. As part of the reverse engineering process, I've found the function which creates these rectangles within the game world. And what we want to do is change the size of the rectangles being created, but only if a specific condition is met. With the hook address already found, let's continue solving this problem by writing our hook function. The first thing we want to do is to store the return address, which is the first address on the stack and dictates where we just came from and will be important later in this function. Next, we'll move into the base address variable, what is currently stored in the ESP register. Next, we should use popAD to preserve the registers and stack before messing around with anything. If you're an ASM pro, you can keep going in ASM here. But I'm not, so let's stop writing ASM and switch back over to C. We can then directly write C here, performing any action we like. For our use case, we can compare values on the stack and depending on that condition, change the size of the player text clip region rectangle. Rather than limiting the rectangle to a width of 200, we can instead increase it to a width of 420. Once we are done making our changes, we can switch back over to ASM to perform our own function cleanup. We restore the registers and stack back to how they were before we started, rewrite the ASM instructions we overwrote and mangled when first writing our hook, then return back to where we started. That's it, that's function hooking at work. Now, whenever our trainer is injected into the game, the rectangle drawing the player's name and resources will be twice as wide, giving more space to write and display data. Microsoft has also released their Detours library, which can basically do all the above steps for you too. You just need to define the functions more clearly and implement your hook at specific function locations. In the next video, we are going to jump back into the game and perform some more reverse engineering to find interesting locations to hook and then actually write and create those hooks. If you made it this far, thanks for watching. It really helps the channel grow if you comment, like and subscribe below. Also, if you're interested in solving capture the flag challenges 
across a range of traditional, Jeopardy-based categories, including reverse engineering, make sure to check out 247ctf.com.